Namaste. So if you've been following us for a while, you already know that this is not a uh, platform for some sectarian uh, rant. Uh, we're not pushing any particular ideology. We're not limiting our search to any one particular line, but rather we eclectically go into all original sources, not derivatives, in order to develop our own personal self-realization. And then we make these videos as a record of where we've been and where we're going, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, in other words, we practice what we preach. And we only speak from experience. It's not about doctrine or dogma or speculation. Uh, it's our own personal experience of the path. And I think this gives our uh, series a certain authenticity that's often lacking in others. And uh, I hope you can feel this. I hope you appreciate it. And um, so don't take this as a, mm, a commercial, you know, <laughs> for some sect or cult. It's just one guy working his way <laughs> through <laughs> all the different layers down to the truth. So with that <laughs> little introduction, uh, the last couple of series, the Sri Vidya series and the Devi Kalotra series, uh, after doing the practices and experiencing the result, I felt quite an improvement in my state of being and my quality of life. Uh, in a word, I was happier. <laughs> so because of this, I decided to uh, look into the Shiva's teaching a little deeper. Basically, in Devi Kalotra, uh, if you download it and read it, which you really should, the link is in the video description of every video in the series, you will find that he basically teaches one technique only, meditation on the void. Now, for most of us, meditation on the void is a very difficult thing. And that's because we've been conditioned since the moment we popped out of the womb, maybe even before, that we are an individual person, uh, a real being, living in a world of things, objects, and those are also real, and that uh, we have individual free will, we have uh, so many attributes, an identity, uh, individuality, and so on. And, um, of course, to actually reach the void all this has to go. There's no room for it. It's excess baggage. So it's very difficult for us who are born and raised in Western society, materialistic society, uh, social society, where you're expected to allow the society, the, the group, social group that you're in to condition you, uh, to form your views and your actions and so on, where we're, we're conditioned from literally from childhood to do everything in a group. I mean, there are just so many obstacles to overcome. So I decided I'm going to take some help. And I went looking for and found a traditional forest monastery 
and uh, fortunately was accepted as a kind of uh, semi-permanent guest. <laughs> and it's really wonderful because, you know, I, I was ordained before. I was a monk before. And so the abbot or the head monk or whatever you want to call him uh, has given me practically the privileges of an ordained monk, but without any of the responsibilities. <laughs> so literally, all I have to do is meditate. And I do. I take full advantage of the facilities here, which are wonderful. And I've been meditating many hours a day for, what is it, about the last two weeks. And I've made wonderful progress, both in my studies and my practice. Of course, I'm a student of Bhikkhu Katukurunde Nyanananda, uh, not the other Nyanananda who founded Mahanamueva, or whatever it's called, which is kind of a cultish uh, Buddhist thing. But the other Nyanananda, <laughs> the writer, who, at a very early age, realized Nibbana and then proceeded to write a series of wonderful books about it. So I've been studying those books. He is my teacher, so I'm following him. And I've discovered some really wonderful things, some really surprising things. That, you know, mixing these different methods and metaphors for me, is not really a problem at all. I guess it would be for some people. Some people think, well, either you're a Hindu or you're a Buddhist. Either you're this or you're that. <laughs> I don't look at it that way. The way I look at it, there's the truth. There's the actuality. There is what is. And then there are these different points of view, different ways of looking at it different uh, descriptive languages that uh, give us different, uh, how can I say, points of access to that truth and enable uh, various different realizations and so forth. So to switch from essentially the Advaita view given by Ramana Maharshi and the Upanishads, Vedanta, and like that, which is essentially a positivist view. Uh, in other words, uh, you are Brahman. You are Shiva. Shiva Ham. Aham Brahmasmi. Uh, to switch from that to the Buddhist view of Nibbana as the uh, cessation of all Sankhara, antic commitments. Uh, promises to be or become something. Uh, Nibbana is always defined negatively as the absence of this or that, the absence of becoming. Bhava nirodho Nibbana. So when the Buddha speaks negatively, it sounds like he's talking about something different. But in fact, the experience of both teachings is the same. It's only the language, only the logic that's different. And so we shouldn't be uh, surprised when someone like me stops in his tracks and goes, wait a minute, I think this other system will serve us better at this point. And then, you know, seemingly overnight... <laughs> to switch the language, to uh, switch countries, to switch hairstyles. <laughs> but see, it's not really a problem if you know the thing that's being talked about. That's the point. If you really know Nibbana, or if you really know the self, you realize they're the same thing. Just different modes of expression, that's all. 
So not to get too excited about that. Anyway, after doing those series on Sri Vidya, Devi Kalotara, I was feeling pretty good. But upon inspecting my consciousness at a deeper level, I found that it was still conditioned, even though very subtly, it was still based on the body and the senses and the mind. It was still unstable because these things are always changing. Huh? You know, it's like uh, a skateboard. A skateboard is unstable by its very nature. It tends to roll around and it can tip and <laughs> even turn over or whatever. So to try to stand on a skateboard is a, a risky proposition. It can slide out from under you at any moment. In the same way, to base our consciousness on the senses, the six senses, salayatana, uh, sight, hearing, uh, taste, smell, touch, and the mind, is uh, going to lead to an unstable situation. These things are always changing, especially the mind. I mean, one time the Buddha was asked to give a simile that describes the changeability of the mind. And of course, the Buddha is a master of similes. He can come up with a simile for just about anything. But he had to admit defeat. He said, monks, I cannot come up with a simile that adequately describes the instability of the mind, the changeability of the mind. The mind can change from one end of the universe to the other in the blink of an eye. So because the mind is based on extremes and dichotomies, good, bad, right, wrong, up, down, in, out, truth, lies, you know, and on and on and on. Because the mind is an extreme thing by nature, it tends to go to extremes rather easily. So to transcend the mind, to transcend the senses, we have to find another base for consciousness. And, and the Buddha teaches that the uh, supreme base for consciousness is nothing, emptiness, shunyata. So if we base our consciousness in emptiness, which is the same as saying nothing, then consciousness will be stable because nothingness never changes. Nothingness is unborn. Therefore, it never dies. It has no qualities, so there's nothing to change. It has no dimension, so it can't move. No position, so it, it can't get lost. And on and on. Nothingness is the ideal. Now, what is this nothingness? What is this shunyata? Well, it's actually the same thing as Brahman in the Vedic system. It's just described in a different way. No thingness. There are no things there. There's no becoming. There's no even possibility of becoming in nothingness, in emptiness. So to base our consciousness on emptiness is the ultimate platform for self-realization. So, how do we do that? <laughs> Tatrapahang bhikave neva agating vadami nagating natiting nachuting na upapating apattitang apavatang anaramanang evatang es ev anto dukasa. I say, monks, there is neither a coming nor going, 
nor a standing, nor a passing away, nor a being reborn. That state which is unestablished, non-continuing, and objectless is itself the end of suffering. So, this objectless consciousness in the Vedic system is known as Turiya, or Turiya Tita. The pure, self-referential consciousness that has no object except self. So it's objectless. So it's not really consciousness as we know consciousness, because consciousness always has an object. It's awareness, pure awareness and pure being. So it's very easy to imagine this, but it's not so easy to experience it. <laughs> it takes a special environment, and that's why I'm here. It's in the middle of the woods, very quiet, natural place, nothing but birds and water sounds. And the temple just up the hill here. There's a chanting going on morning and evening. I have a little meditation hut. In fact, I'm sitting there now. And I spend hours a day just sitting here, looking in. And letting go of the sankhara. Because that's the method, that's the means, that's the actual how to meditate on nothingness, the void, emptiness, shunyata. Huh? So if we want to implement Shiva's instruction, which I think is a very good idea, <laughs> he uh, has given us this instruction so that we can realize that we are him. <laughs> so that we can realize Shiva hung. I am Shiva. And I'll get into all the reasons why we would want to do that in the later installments of this series. I just want to kick things off and let you know I'm not slacking off too much. <laughs> uh, but in the two weeks that I've been here, I've made some dramatic progress. Even just last night, I had a wonderful breakthrough, and I was able to actually situate my consciousness in the emptiness. And so this uh, stilling of all fabrications, of all made-up things, uh, collectively called... Uh, Sankara. There's no good translation for that word. We'll get into that next time. When one experiences this even for a moment, you can never forget it. It's like this explains, finally, after so many years, what happened to me back in 1984. And now I understand clearly how I attained that and why. And also how I lost it. <laughs> but now I, now I know the path. That was an accident. That was a happy, you know, beginner's luck. But now I know step by step the process, how to get back to that state. And that's what I want to share with you in this series. Aung Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.